Oh, I'm sorry. So this session will start with an introductory note from our chair, Tiash Ghosh. So Tiash, over to you for the introductory note. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, it's a uh, it's my pleasure to welcome each and everyone present here, and also uh, the guest lecture for today. Uh, uh, so thank you all for showing interest in today's talk. And on behalf of the IEEE Signal Processing Society Student Branch, IIT Kharagpur, I welcome our guest for today's session. So uh, let me introduce uh, today's uh, speaker. Dr. Akanksha Pathak. She has been working recently as the principal engineer at US-based semiconductor manufacturing company Global Foundries. She has completed her guidance uh, and uh, her PhD from IIT Kharagpur itself under the guidance of Professor Gautam Shah from uh, ECA department. She has completed her MTech in uh, robotic specialization from IIT Allahabad and her BTech from uh, uh, Uttar Pradesh Technical University in Electronics and Instrumentation Domain. So her principal uh, research uh, interest lies in applied uh, machine learning, deep learning, and biomedical signal and image processing. So without further delay, I just want uh, ma'am to uh, begin with her session on the uh, different methods uh, for biomedical signal and uh, signal processing using machine learning methods for cardiac disease detection using the heart sounds. So I just request uh, everyone to please kindly uh, mute your uh, mute themselves. And uh, at the end, please ask any question you have in mind. Ma'am is going to definitely answer the questions. And uh, please fill up your name in the attendance uh, sheet that would be provided in the chat box. So welcome, ma'am. Please continue with the session. Thank you, Tiyash and the entire IEEE SPS Society. It is indeed a pleasure to be here as a speaker uh, when I myself was a part of this organizing committee. So yeah, it's all together a new experience. So let's start with it. So is it full screen available? Yes, it yeah, is. Yeah, okay. So good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Akamsha, and I'll be presenting the two, today's the SPS Signal Processing Society Student Branch talk. So the topic of this talk is basically biomedical signal processing and machine learning methods for cardiac disease detection using heart sounds. Um, this the work or the talk is basically based on the my PhD work undertaken during my the IIT Kharagpur tenure. So though I have tried to make it like more in, uh, based on intuition sense on how to deal with a biosignal based uh, problem, but still like more the methods will be uh, truly like confined, sometimes confined to other special disease, which I will be dealing with here. So first is heart sounds. So what are heart sounds? I think we must have heard about the heart sounds e either in our bio books or through some Bollywood movies. What do they uh, appear like and how do we hear them? So they are mostly like love dub, a sequence of love dub or um, let me play if it is good. Okay, so heart sounds are basically uh, generated due to the mechanical activity of the heart. Mechanical activity basically means the uh, regular relaxation and, uh, compre and uh, compression phase of this uh, uh, heart. Basically, heart sounds are produced due to, if you can say, due to opening and closing of the walls, the four walls, if we remember, the aortic, mitral, and the tricuspid, and the pulmonary. Another analogy which we can understand that how heart sounds are produced is like suppose uh, if you remember the the water pipe through which we usually water our plants if that pipe is stenosed or constricted or obstructed at some point then you might hear some sounds of so sound or you might feel the vibration in the pipe due to that constriction if the pressure is too too much in the water pipe so similar is the case with the heart sounds whenever the blood offers or obstruct is obstructed 
in the vessels in any form due to stenosis or other obstruction then what happens is the energy is dissipated either in form of uh, vibrations vibration is something which is not audible and when it is an audible frequency range it is heard as a sound or a murmur whatever we term it as unwanted noises or the abnormalities are termed as murmurs and uh, healthy sounds healthy activity is termed as sounds heart sounds and if it is not at all audible we we term it as just vibrations so normal heart sound basically comprises of four main phases first is the s1 sound the this sinusoidal wave uh, then next is the silent phase systole next is the s2 sound uh, the dub sound which we say and then a comparatively longer but again a little bit silent phase diastole so this is a repetitive cycle now what is phonocardiogram so you are using you are using the terms as heart sound and we can only listen them using stethoscopes but how do we use those sounds to process it at our end so the electronic recording of these heart sounds which is displayed in form of a graphical pattern as shown in this figure is known as a phonocardiogram so as we can see this figure this figure is taken from our own data acquisition system which i used in this study so basically what we do is we attach some sort of transducer uh, in the stethoscope to convert this uh, sound into an a digital record and then it can be saved using some uh, daily used uh, softwares to record the heart sounds in form of uh, in whatever in file format you want so that you can hear it as well as access it so as we heard a normal sound what would be a abnormal sound be like so an abnormal sound would be like uh, if you i hope it is audible and this is for another abnormality okay so um j uh, just a quick go through stenosis basically something when the blood is unable to move in a forward direction due to the constriction and regurgitation is something when the blood flows backward due to the improper closing of the valve so stenosis is due to uh, improper opening of the valve and regurgitation is due to improper closing of the valve valve can be considered as a sort of two phase door which is unable to open and close Uh, which is able which is whose opening and closing basically regulates the blood flow now what are the prerequisites for disease detection using any biosignals so this is like i think a mandatory check which you should which one should go through before starting with any biosignal for any sort of disease detection so first is understanding of the disease you need to understand what is the basic disease how is it affecting that organ what is it like how is it caused what are the repercussions of it and so on the statistics how it is got causing the mortality rates and all like you need to be aware of it next is how is the disease manifested in the biosignal so you are using you are going to use a biosignal uh, of your interest for diagnosing the disease so in order to go with the entire signal processing paradigm you need to understand how is that disease manifested in that biosignal itself starting from data acquisition how is the signal going to be until you acquire and how is that disease overall manifested in it you need to know then what is the anatomy and physiology of the main organ associated with the disease so suppose you are in this case i am dealing with a heart so i need to be aware what is the basic physiology of the heart then how does it behaves after the disease so that i can relate during my signal processing and i can get an intuition okay so if i am thinking over this process this is uh, inspired because of this process in the anatomy and the physiology of the heart next and last but not the least is the what is your advantage or motivation of using the biosignal see obviously biosignals are not practically or we can say uh, commercially 
used to a great extent because of the advanced techniques obviously and one would obviously favor the advanced methods of disease detection rather than using the bio signal because they are a little bit weak but there should be some good motivation or advantage which you can portray in order to convince the society or the research group that okay this is the main reason why i want to go with the signal so i just quick go through here in this talk today we will be dealing with coronary artery disease so this disease in layman terms you can refer to it as a sort of a heart attack disease which we commonly know uh, that uh, the cholesterol build up in these arteries the coronary arteries basically reduces the blood supply or the oxygenated blood supply to the heart muscles so this is uh, as uh, shown in this figure this artery is not a single artery coronary artery this is a, like a network of artery okay so the, uh, as shown in this figure there whenever there is a build up of cholesterol or in technical terms a plaque in the inner walls of these artery what happens is it limits the oxygenated blood supply so the blood supply is reduced to these heart muscles which will gradually lead to uh, the uh, decay of the tissues of the heart muscles and hence the heart will lose its ability to contract and relax so the disease is obviously very fatal but it has a positive aspect that if it is identified at a, at a good initial stage it can be prevented to turn into more fatal so there are some existing diagnostic methods which are like invasive and non invasive invasive i mean is like which in the test which in which the testing methods get intruded into your body and the ones which are not intruded are like non invasive so we have ct scans and some non invasive methods like treadmill based ecg and electrocardiography so the, obviously uh, we see like the gold standard is the angiography method gold. now a quick go through through the anatomy so anatomy is like not it is not just a single artery but a network of artery but so we have right divisions left division and then some common sub divisions of the left artery as well now the arteries have these arteries have different diameters among themselves also moreover the blood flow is also not like constant uh, through all these arteries in both the phases so like you see in one of the artery like left one left coronary artery blood flow is more in the diastolic phase and less in the systolic phase and in the other artery approximately same blood flows in both the phases now main thing is like how is the disease going to be manifested in the heart sounds so uh, this is like a main basic build, building block to understand how is your disease getting manifested so that you can think of in your case also how is how are you going to apply your signal processing methods so whenever blood flows in a healthy vessel or a normal blood vessel it follows a parabolic path parabolic path means the particles at the center are moving in a more higher speed compared to those at the edges but whenever there is a constriction or obstruction offered by appeared in the uh, appears in the blood vessel what happens is the particles of the blood start moving in some random direction so this random direction is produces uh, the, uh, produces abnormal sounds which are known as murmurs again the same thing if they are audible they will be some murmurs but if they are not audible they will be termed as vibrations but the streamline flow or the laminar flow does not produces any sound it is like very calm and composed so in this case we, uh, we say that the heart sounds uh, since they are generated due to the same activity as i discussed before so these vibrations and murmurs if any are added to this original heart sound itself so in this way we can say that okay my heart sound signal is getting added with extra other vibrations and uh, sounds which are generated due to obstruction of in the blood vessels okay so uh, yeah this is just uh, some detailed discussion like which some sometimes some special phases are being affected or the entire signal is getting affected so 
so we expect or there's an intuition that okay all these abnormalities which are added at different phases of the cardiac cycle they are expected to provide some distinguishing feature to the uh, cad heart sounds compared to the normal heart sounds okay and then last but not the least what is the motivation see the currently we saw that the gold standard method was costing like thousand dollars just for testing and then you go for treatment and if if in case the test is negative you are losing those thousand dollars so a primary level test should not be that much expensive and as well as it is invasive so uh, mostly people avoid testing with such gold standard test because obviously the cost and the pain they suffer during this testing as a result, so in such a case if at a primary of uh, care uh, level if we are using some non invasive and some low cost uh, method that would be obviously like good since people will approach more for testing so this is like one of the major advantage with heart sounds they are non invasive they are low cost we just need a simple stethoscope and a, a system for diagnosing it major important but a uh, point of using this uh, entire signal processing and computer aided diagnosis is that uh, auscultation uh, is like the proficiency of auscultation is very low among the physicians as i uh, played those two sounds for the disease case uh, you need to be trained properly to identify which sound corresponds to which abnormality now this is a like very practiced uh, even for senior cardiologists this uh, this proficiency is like not or 100% it is about 80% so you need rigorous training to identify the sounds as per the disease so which is not possible for a human listening and it limits our auscultation ability so in this context we can say that a computer aided method finds its way okay now uh, as i already discussed how the data is acquired this is just like uh, how the data was used in our study so main key points of the data or the phonocardiogram being recorded is the, like the sampling frequency which you should use so you, uh, there should be a general uh, knowledge from the prior knowledge from the literature what is the range of the frequency of your signal and obviously by nyquist straight criteria you can go for twice the highest frequency content so to be on a safer side Uh, we took like more than the nyquist rate you have any prior experience okay like what in case uh, the we can we can have a higher range of frequencies just for being on a safer side we took 8 kilohertz and the uh, sensors obviously depends on you so uh, you can go for uh, the better the sensors are the better is the credibility of your data obviously so uh, you can use this in our case like we have used four sensors or four stethoscopes at and we are using them to record the data simultaneously from four different sides on the chest so like at a go data from all these four locations is be is being recorded simultaneously in the form of and being stored in form of pcm dot wave format so here we have used like data of 40 cad and 40 normal male subjects yeah now comes the paradigm for biosignal processing so uh, basic paradigm as shown is pre processing then segmentation pitch extraction selection and then classification so what is pre processing so the pre processing is like removal of just nourishing your signal to get the most of out of it this is a very crucial stage if you don't after data if you don't pre process your signal if you start dealing with noises uh, also along with your signal then you might uh, lose important information and might be dealing with some irrelevant content so pre processing is basically like removal of artifacts a noise some power line interference some physiological interference for example physiological interference what is physiological interference physiological interference is something which automatically gets added to your signal and you can't help about it removing it at the acquisition stage at least in for example in case of heart sound if you have some bowel sounds in the stomach so they get automatically added to the signal during acquisition 
So you need some sort of signal processing to remove those sounds. If you can identify them by listening or by some visual, visual display. Or the respiratory sounds, uh, if you uh, which automatically get added to the signal while acquiring the heart sound or vice versa. For example, you are acquiring the respiratory sounds. Your motive is to acquire respiratory sound. Then heart sound will automatically be added in that signal. You can hear it very nicely. Other could be like uh, a, a mother with a fetus, with a fetus in a womb. So the fetus sounds automatically get, get added to those of mothers. So these are some ir, like uh, those interferences which you cannot unavoidable interferences. They get added. Either you change your data acquisition methodology according, accordingly or use some sig uh, signal processing methods to remove these interferences. Next is artifacts and noise. Artifacts and noise basically refers to uh, environmental noises. Uh, for example, the environment where you are acquiring in a hospital, you might hear uh, voices of people or the machine related sounds. They might get added to the signal. Next is power line interference. So power line interference is like that 50 hertz or 60 hertz frequency or the power supply, which usually gets added to the signal because of this electronic recording system. So these uh, interferences need to be removed before you start dealing with your signal at later stages. Next is like band limiting the signal. So if you have a prior knowledge, okay, 1000 hertz is a band, is a main band of my signal, then you should do some sort of low pass filtering or high pass filtering, whatever is required uh, as per the usage. And next, last but not the least is normalization. So after doing all these processes, obviously you are using some signal processing. So the values of the signal might change a lot so you need to scale them at a definite range. So either use a Z normalization or a min max scaler, whatever suits your need. Next process is segmentation. So segmentation is what? Segmentation is like identifying the main phase or the event or the cycle or the fragment. Like what do you need for dealing with the signal? Do you need some specific phases? For example, in our case, do I need only systole or diastole or S1 or S2? So what do I need among all those phases? Or is it like, do I need the entire cycle for my feature extraction purpose? Or do I need a longer fragment, like multiple cycles at once? Or So this is like epoch. So what do you need? You need to, uh, identify it either using literature or using some statistical methods which convince you that okay you should go for this next is feature extraction so the feature extraction could be handcrafted or representation learning based handcrafted i've just listed four you can say some sort of broad categories but it can be more than that <coughs> excuse me so handcrafted is like time domain since we are dealing with a signal one dimensional signal, we can say time domain, frequency domain, time frequency domain, or even non-linear domain. So all this is a part of biomedical signal processing. And feature selection classification will be attributed towards the machine learning. In this case, basically we are dealing with, uh, in our case, we took pre-processing as just low pass filtering, limiting it to 500 Hertz. Since our signal was uh, by audio investigation, we found that there were not much noises. Moreover, the data in our case was also recorded in a breath hold state. So automatically we eliminated the respiratory sounds. So this was like one technique. But obviously if you are taking a res the sound, recording the sound in a breath hold state, it limits the duration of the data. One cannot stop the breath for one minute. It is It can be holded for a few seconds. So there comes a trade-off. Um, and uh, next is like normalize the signal using Z normalization. So you can see like this is a visual uh, display of the CAD and normal heart sounds. And the labels on the right, this MIT, TRI, PEARL and MA basically refers to the four auscultation sites on the chest, mitral, tricuspid, pulmonary and midaxillary and so on. So I think visually if, if you are able, if you see, you cannot identify very distinguishing patterns here. And uh, audio-wise also, it is not very prominent, 
to identify okay unlike the stenosis and regurgitation sound which i told which i have displayed before the the visual even the audio characteristics are not also very differentiable so this is like a very uh, hard problem because unlike the previous cases where i showed the regurgitation stenosis of the walls they are very evident the visuals are evident the audio is evident okay there is an anomaly but in case of cad uh, this is very difficult basically because the murmurs of the generated are very weak since they are on the muscles so it is very weak uh, they are very weak to get added to your sound in a very strong manner so we can only expect our intuition is that there are vibrations which are being added to the signal and we hope we have some patterns accordingly so now in our case like how do we go for that segmentation process so um, we use some sort of statistical testing in order to identify do i need to go with any specific phase for example in this literature survey we have a dominant literature saying that only diastoles are the ones which should be used for investigation because diastole is the phase where maximum blood flow occurs in the coronary arteries okay so there's a lot of clinical evidence as well as uh, technical evidence of using the diastole but still one should not block his head with the prior literature but uh, i think you should also proceed with like uh, with his own intuition and understanding and, and a curiosity that let us go through some other ways also so what i did was i just took four different frequency zones and segmented these phases s1 phase systolic s2 and diastolic using a established segmentation algorithm in the domain and computed uh, the slope of the spectrum of these phases in these four frequency zones so uh, the ones marked in blue the as blue asterisk or dot if you, whatever you identify it as basic so this is basically a uh, a bar plot bar plot basically means like a the inner circle shows the mean of the data and the whiskers show the variability or the standard deviation of the data so red is for uh, uh, cad and the black is for black bar is for normal and the ones highlighted with blue are like statistically significant statistically significant means okay they are like differentiable these phases so, and it is done for all the four channels so what we see not just the diastoles but other phases also either in inter some intermediate frequency zones or overall they are discriminative so why should i only go for diastole i will go with the entire cycle so this is my intuition so what we did is okay i am taking entire cycle but again i am not just taking going to take one single cycle see the one single cycle duration is uh, is maybe approximately for example one second or even less than that so that length will not be sufficient for proper spectrum representation see the so time is um, the frequency is inversely proportional to time so the longer the length of time duration of the signal you will get the better the resolution in the frequency domain so uh, that is why uh, i proceeded to go with like two consecutive cycles in order to get a better spectrum estimation or identify better signatures another key aspect in biomedical signal processing is how do you epoch this is like very important stage because this is the stage where you are going to decide how good your model is going to be trained so for example in my case we have only 80 subjects so if i use the entire 10 second data as a single epoch i would be left only with 80 instances and now with 80 instances i have to train the model test the model and if it is a neural network i need the validation data too so i think this is a very less data compared to the image processing or other domains where we have the data in form of thousands so this is the phase where you have the chance to increase the instances of your data uh, so what we do is like okay i am take from the 10 second data i am taking three epochs i am forming three epochs so in this case in this while i am increasing my epoch count to like 960 80 subjects four channels and then three epochs i am taking it like i raised it from 80 to 960 okay 
So this is like, I think everyone should focus on this phase. How are you going to use your segments? Because the segments basically are using the segment knowledge is not only based on literature, but also uh, uh, it also lays the foundation on of a future machine learning training model. Now we start with the first contribution, which is uh, based on the spectrum representation. So before starting with it, I want to uh, tell that we will be dealing with a hierarchy of feature extraction methods. So the first and foremost hierarchy I have laid as spectrum representation. So spectrum, as we all know, basically uh, tells us about what is the frequency uh, range of the signal uh, with the yeah, so how is like power distributed in the basic frequency range of the signal? So uh, the one of the initial which concepts which we all know, I think, is like the Fourier transform, which has told us like what is the content of the signal with respect to the sinusoidal basis functions in the Fourier which we use. So here, uh, like there's obviously a little bit of uh, physiological understanding behind uh, laying the uh, contribution in the signal processing domain. So a little bit of uh, um, physiology is that the sounds or the hard sounds basically they are transmitted at different auscultation sites with some delay. So obviously you can hear the sound from different places though they are generated at some point but they are transmitted at different places. So uh, but the murmurs or the chest on the chest they may or may not be completely transmitted. So uh, since we were acquiring the data from multiple sites, what we uh, uh, proposed is I wanted to correlate the data of or the heart sound of two auscultation sites. Like how is it correlated, but in frequency domain. So as we have co cross correlation in time domain, we have the cross power spectral density in frequency domain. Now the twist comes that instead of uh, using the Cross uh, the usually what we do is when we have the spectrum we use the absolute values of those spectrum but instead of using the absolute values of the spectrum we I propose to use the imaginary part of that spectrum so what is the advantage of using the imaginary part so imaginary part basically tells us that it is unresponsive to zero or time zero lag signals let me give some sort of mathematical uh, illustration of this. So suppose S X Y is the spectrum cross power spectrum density of signal X and Y. Uh, these operators obviously are expectation operator, and I have written this in form of a complex number rectangular paradigm fashion. So A X A Y amplitudes cos delta phi and sine de delta phi is obviously the phase difference, and this. Is it. So usually what we go is when we take the magnitude of the spectrum. We just take the magnitude of this complex number. But imaginary component is restricted only to the sine phi function, the sine phi, ax, ay, sine phi, sine delta of sine of delta phi. Now, if this phase is zero, what is what is, is it going to be? It is this imaginary part is going to be zero, but we'll still have the real part, and that gets added, that is retained in the magnitude. So this imaginary component is basically retaining only those similarities which are delayed with some phase difference, with non-zero phase difference. Now, so what happens is whenever noise gets added to the signal, uh, so the noises usually are, uh, in especially the environmental noises, they are usually additive in time domain. So for example, original signal was Y and some noise gets added, it becomes Y hat. In Fourier transform, by the linearity property, we can say uh, it, it the noise is also the spectrum of noise is also added in the same way. Now, if we take the cross power spectrum density of these noisy signals, what we get is original signals cross spectrum plus noise cross spectrum. So, what happens is we get uh, this uh, sine of delta phi n x and n y. Now what happens is for environmental noises that uh, we consider them that they are up, uh, appearing from a distant place. So whenever something is falling from a distant place, we say that it is appearing as parallel waves. Same 
for example if you have heard you have must have dealt with it in our physics classes that if something is coming from far off place it is uh, then it is received in form of parallel waves so in parallel waves means the there would be no phase lag and when we are capturing that noise with no phase lag at multiple channels so obviously the phase difference is zero so when we are dealing with imaginary component of the spectrum we automatically get rid of the noise spect cross spectrum but in the magnitude and the even if basic same psd also if we say uh, the noise gets added so this is the advantage of using the imaginary component and i'm i would like to mention that it is not restricted to uh, this idea is not restricted only to hard sounds one can use it whenever uh, if he sees that uh, okay there is sort of phase lag condition and i can i would like to use an imaginary component to get rid of the components which are automatically getting added with without some phase difference so uh, i must i would like to mention that i inherited this idea from the neuro domain itself so uh, so once we establish okay which spectrum we want to use okay now the question arises what features so spectrum i will just say it was estimated using welch method and these are the uh, basic configurations so now this is the spectrum of all the 4c2 six channel combinations we can say it is like highly overlapping since it is highly overlapping we can say that it is not very nicely differentiated so the theory which we had that visually and audio it is not differentiated we can see it in spectrum domain also the cad and normal hard sounds are not discriminative so what we but they are discriminated in some intermediate frequency zones if we see in some cases but not completely overall you can say okay this is highly discriminative uh, patterns so again a statistical testing was done to to validate my intuition i am saying that some in some bands or some frequency regions it is discriminative but not overall so a statistical test not only gives you a confidence to proceed but it also gives you a good quantitative proof okay that yes and it proves your intuition also so, uh, because our uh, research is not just based on intuition it also it is also based on facts and evidence and statistical test so one should obviously try to validate the intuition using some sort of statistical testing but how to design that test is also based on your intuition so what uh, i did was i again took some intermediate frequency zones low medium high and the overall and computed the uh, slope and area under the curve of that cross imaginary cross spectrum for all the six channel combination so the, again this is the mean mean error plot so what we see is that in the intermediate frequency zones you will see more uh, significant uh, portions compared to the overall frequency zone so okay this gives you a confidence that yes uh, a band level approach will be more good to extract the features rather than using the overall spectrum as a single entity so usually you can go with any sort of test uh, para, uh, statistical testing it depends on your data if the data is normally distributed you should go for uh, t test uh, or the z test whichever suits your uh, data count but if you your data is not normally distributed or you don't know which distribution it is following we usually go with uh, non parametric test like wilcox some ransom test or others for feature that just extracted um, considering the intuition of slope i took ratio of power of adjacent subbands and spectral centroid so these were extracted based on some bandwidth but again the question come what should be the proper bandwidth i don't have any proper um, intuition or the idea or a, or a proof that what should be the prominent bandwidth so sometimes we can use empirical based approaches also so i just empirically experimented with narrow bandwidths of 5 hertz to broad bandwidths of 100 hertz so 5 hertz bandwidth means i am making the band in the range of 0 to 5 5 to 10 and so on and for 100 it's like 0 to 100 100 to 200 and so on so i am computing like ratio of power of adjacent subband spectral centroid and statistical moments of the first two moments of the of this power in the bands 
So in this way, I'm not going to deal with the show with the results, but uh, since my aim is not to show the results, but uh, focus more on the signal processing. So we use these features and uh, yeah, finally we've built a model, which will I'll discuss later. So this is like the first hierarchy. Next is like the time frequency representation. Now I'm moving to a higher hierarchy. Why I'm moving to a higher hierarchy? See, first of all, uh, the bio signals are like highly non-stationary signals. So, and using a spectrum based approach is like, uh, I'm dealing with a stationary signal. So there are a lot of transient events. Transient events are like something which is very localized at some instant of time. So obviously something which is a very minute event, which is occurring for a very smaller phase will get overshadowed in your spectrum. You will never be able to localize it well that when this event took place. But a time frequency representation is like you are studying very precisely at which time, what was the frequency component of the signal, which frequency was high, which frequency was low and so on. So obviously a time frequency representation gives you a better clarity. Okay. Now, uh, the next question arises, which time frequency representations should you go for? So uh, it's not like that you should always go for the trending representations in the research. A speech signal is still tried like the basic layout of the speech signal processing is short time Fourier transform because they are suitable for it since they follow the norms for using the short time for it and so that the signal is stationary for short duration. If I am speaking in a, in a tone, obviously some content of my speech will be stationary until unless I change the emotion or the content of my, of my speech. So a short time for transform is suitable for speech even till now, but for the CW or the, but for the bio signals, other bio signals, some advanced like uh, methods like wavelet transform or the reassignment algorithms are trying to be like more suitable compared to short time Fourier transform. The reason being uh, in this figure. So these are like uh, two, uh, the signals for two CAD and two normal subjects. They are taken from the same auscultation cells and we have the uh, three time frequency representations. So first is short time Fourier transform. Next is CWT, continuous wavelet transform. And, la la and the last is single squeezing transform. This is a reassignment or we can say a post-processing of the CWT. So in STFT, we can see that the S1 and S2 sounds are identified. You can see, but obviously the localization and time is not very good. Uh, the see the sound is spread s1 sound is spread to a great extent but in uh, but here in we can see okay the that resolution this is what resolution means you are not able to localize it properly in time domain next is cwt okay the sounds are localized well in time domain and frequency domain but when you see that the uh, power in the adjacent time uh, bins is like not changing much the reason being, we perform convolution operation. So convolution operation is not just performing the convolution at a particular dimension. It is using adjacent bin also to perform that convolution operation. So even though there is there was least power in that particular time period, in that time instant, but still since we were using adjacent bins, so their power gets added up to that, uh, pick, uh, that instant. So this is something like false information. It falls in the category of false information that since they, though there was lesser power at a particular instant, but since we use the power of adjacent bits, it get, it was represented here. So the change in the power content is less, but when we use synchro squeezing transform of the SST, we see that these changes are more evident. The, the representation is showing like more of a true content. Okay. The power content changes as we move from S1 to S2 sound and so on. So this is like the reason. So one should not just go blindly, but see like what suits the requirements better. Now the next case is even so see, even though we have this time frequency representation, but our problem is yet not solved. Can you say that which one is normal or which one is scanned? No. So another level of, of feature mining is obviously essential. Now uh, what to go for it? So in my, uh, here I, 
tried to use the entropy. So entropy was not only the reason for taking the entropy was not only just based on what I wanted to use. Actually, it was inspired more from literature. Entropy is something which has been extensively used in all the biosignal processing. So what is entropy? Entropy is something like um, how surprised you are to for in with a certain processing of events. For example, if BJ, I will try to give a very simple example. If elections are going to happen and there are more chance and we know okay, BJP is going to win, the entropy of this event or this result is completely like very zero. Okay, it is evident that BJP is going to win. But if apps all of a sudden comes up as a winner, this is a, like a more informative. This is like a more surprising thing. Oh my God. So there's so much randomness. Is it? So this event has a very high entropy app winning compared to BJP is in. So the more surprise or more random behavior you see, the, the higher is your entropy. So in what happened is that there was the usage of entropy in my literature, but entropy never stood out as a winning feature ever. People were using, but they were not coming with satisfactory results, which is like highly surprising. Why is it not? Entropy is like very uh, good feature to display the disease states compared to normal state because disease in disease you get like surprise. Oh, this is like very rare occasion. So entropy is high compared to a normal uh, event. So what uh, I decided was to go with a somewhat different approach to use the entropy. So, so this block diagram shows it. So instead of using the like, um, what I did was, this is a time frequency matrix. I bro broke it into bands in the frequency domain as done previously, and then divided along the time axis also, I divided into frames, so overlapping frames. I took just eight frames with 50% overlap. So entropy was computed for each frame in each subband. So in band wise also, I was trying to uh, uh, check out all the precise uh, uh, places where I could get signature as well as in time also. So uh, this is like the one, uh, the way which I tried to use. I did some statistical tests again uh, by, as to convince myself and the readers like why it should be a, like a frame wise approach rather than just computing the entropy for the entire epoch at once. So for example, this a statistical test, the so upper box plot is uh, showing the, uh, the entropy for eight frames of the B1 band. Or, but the lower box plot is showing the entire uh, entropy computed from B1 band, like irrespective of any frame for the complete epoch. So what we see, even though the frame F1 and F4 of the B1 band are like discriminative or statistically significant, the entire band as a whole is not statistically significant. So this is like the main point. Okay, so the information or the entropy is discriminative only at certain phases and not throughout the cardiac cycle. So these are like, I will say one should go for, uh, uh, um, identify like which phases are discriminative. For example, because in our case, the signals are so weak that you cannot just go through the entire signal and use it as a discriminative pattern. You need to uh, magnify and zoom your use cases where you should use in either in time or be it in frequency. Um, I will not go through it. Okay. So this is just like showing why I'm using two different entropies, Shannon and Renji. So these are like very interesting. Um, so what happens is in these two entropies are redundant, but they are also uh, complementary, but they are redundant in like lower frequency zones and they are complementary in higher frequency zones. So this is basically based on the formula which we use for them. So one should try to explore more options. We should obviously try for more um, complementary aspects, but sometimes a little bit of redundancy can also be used or adjusted to uh, like you can go for this trade-off. Why to which one to use?
and uh, last uh, the next thing in this time frequency representation was that i was always hoping to use my multi channel informations collectively so in the spectrum representation obviously i went with the uh, the cross spectrum based approach which was automatically using multiple channels in each phase but here since we are dealing with feature extraction of each channel using time frequency representation and the entropy so i went with like uh, fusing the channel information at score level so uh, whatever scores we get from the classifier or the probabilities were fused to obtain uh, a more uh, strong decision whether the signal is scattered or normal so again this is like more of a physiological based uh, intuition so what is happening is like different sites are capturing different signals and the database is also like vast uh, so you don't have a homogeneous data some patients are like at uh, very fatal stage of the disease some patients are very, like very initial stage of disease for some patients it might be that all the three arteries are stenosed or blocked for some patients only one or two arteries are blocked so my data is not at all homogeneous so this is like first so i should use information from all the sites collectively and basically and moreover since i am if for example for testing making a testing pattern of this system i don't know which site or which artery is also blocked so i want to use information from all the sites because i don't have any prior information if i have not going through angiography or a standard test how do i know that which site is more prone or will be more favorable to identify the disease so that is a multi channel approach was used here instead of just relying on a single channel vote i will go for a combined vote so fusion is obviously a very a good approach uh, but depends the type of fusion you are going with so one can always go from data level to out, to score level or output level fusion whichever suits their purpose and last but not least is the representation i hope we have some time left uh, uh, yes ma'am yes okay patient time left so next is the representation learning so my first two approaches were based on handcrafted feature based approach obviously a handcrafted feature based approach requires a lot of clinical understanding which needs a time and effort to go through the literature understand the bio being from engineering uh, domain you need to study the bio and relate it with your uh, general know how of signal processing and the physics like how to understand it so and related for example if i am using entropy i need a intuition of physiological understanding that why i should use the entropy it is not like using a black box and i am just using the entropy randomly or why am i using the cross power spectrum density i have a understanding that okay the heart sounds are transmitted but in order to use these concepts i had to go through a lot of thorough detail of the system or the heart sounds as well before diagnosing the disease so obviously these demands are fresh, uh, a lot of effort in this context if we go for representation learning at least you will be getting rid though it is not very good because it is a like a sort of black box why which features are being used but still representation learning is something which can help you in this context wherein you will all automatically be learning the features so um, as already so but another advantage of the representation learning is that it is not always uh, like ha- going to happen that whatever physiological understanding you have you can relate it with some technical domain information in order to use it uh, so for example if i am using the uh, the entropy i know okay the complexity or the signal changes so i will i can use entropy but there might be other factors also with which i cannot come up to a quantitative quantity that okay i should use this uh, metric or quantity for analyzing my signals so 
uh, this bridging the gap between the clinical information and the engineering domain is also essential which somehow in handcrafted feature based approach we are not exploiting completely so in this context also i think representation learnings is uh, beneficial to use so as we all know i think uh, what is like deep learning so deep learning is just an example uh, in a subset of representation learning where we are not only learning how to map the features to the class level but we are also learning the features from the input also so cnns uh, we have uh, we all know that they are very data driven and resource hungry and so in, and medical and, and in our case especially we see that we have a very small amount of data like not even 10000 samples it's just the 960 samples so obviously a cnn making your own cnn and training it will be a like very difficult task so uh, we have tried to come up with using the concept of transfer learning okay so transfer learning but before going with it i would like to tell that uh, another experiments experiment which i wanted to use it on my own was I wanted to see how the augmentation of handcrafted features and these trans and these uh, representation learning features help us to uh, deal with this diagnosis. So the source of input was same. That is, uh, I wanted to use same input uh, for the handcrafted feature. That is the time frequency representation for the handcrafted feature, and the same representation or the input for the CNNs. And we wanted to see like what both of uh, these systems are extracting how different is it and whether they are redundant or complementary uh, so, so the few for fusion i'm basically uh, using a kernel based approach which is known as like multiple kernel learning so this will be a little bit interesting okay so a quick go through for the transfer learning uh, transfer learning basically it is not, first of all, it is not only confined to your CNNs, I would like to say it is a general topic. So transfer learning is basically you have a sub, some problem or domain which has some feature space and some probability distribution of the classes, okay. For uh, And then you have another task or another domain which is defined uh, uh, using the same set of things. So. Uh, Transfer learning basically aims to use the knowledge in one domain and, and to use it in some way in the other domain. But on the condition that either the samples are not the same or the probabilities are not the same. Similarly, another condition would be maybe that the task or the class classes are not the same in both the source and uh, domain, source and uh, the task domain or the probabilities are not the same. So something would be matching or something would not be matching. So this is like the concept of transfer learning. You, you will not be using directly CAD and normal as source, one source and then CAD and normal from another channel. This is not transfer learning. You need to export information from another domain to use it somehow in the same, another one more domain. Now the question arises, what to transfer? And how should we transfer? When should we transfer? So what to transfer is like, you can transfer the parameters of the system or your, your your train models or you can transfer the instances of your data if you think so or you can transfer the features so in our case we are transferring the feature representations and what is my source domain my source domain is an imagenet database so imagenet database is a very big uh, 1 million image based database with approximately 1000 classes the classes also varies from like plants. It is like numerous thousand classes are a lot from, I have listed like some of the classes here, animals, persons, fungus, artifacts, sports, natural objects. Like it is multi, highly like multi-class. You cannot, there's not even a one um, hierarchy that such set of classes are there. There's multiple. So, and we have some trained, pre-trained CNNs, which have, or, already learned how to classify the data into these thousand classes. So we have the model that is the weight and the architectures of these CNNs publicly 
available. So what we do is like, so this is like the basic block diagram. We have the target, which is the my pre-processed PCG signals of phonocardiogram signal from four channels. And I have computed that this includes squeezing wavelet transform. And the source is this image net data and the trained CNN model. Now I will use this model version architectures to fine tune those pre-trained CNN models and then use them for classifying CAD and normal, just two classes, which is my target or task function. So a quick go through how does this fine tuning takes place. Um, so uh, suppose this is a CNN for task A or an input A. So what I do is for transferring, I retain some of the initial layers of this CNN. So CNNs are basically uh, neural networks which work on grid-based input. Grid-based input could be an image, 2D image, or a three-dimensional or multi-dimensional matrix grid-based, which has some like rows and columns. It works on, and basically its motive is to extract the features from this grid-based input using the concept of image processing. That is, it uses, identifies the filter, it identifies or learns the filters which are used to extract features from this image type of input. So the uh, general theory is that initial layers learn the generic features. Generic features are like identifying where are the edges, where is their contrast or like what uh, main outline of the image main building blocks and then task specific feature is like identifying where the tree is where the house is localizing it more prominently so this is the case so how do we transfer it we transfer some initial layers so we always want some edges okay to identify i want to demarcate where is my s1 sound where is my s2 sound little bit some boundary where is the noise or like if. and then finally leading to what are like where is how do you know where is cad and where is normal so we retain some of the initial layers so that we don't need to train our system again and we obviously we don't have data that much to train so we have used vgg net so i retained all the convolution layers five convolution layers, and just replace these last uh, fully connected layers fully connected layers with one, uh, the last two with one single fully connected layer and the output layer with a single output a layer with two neurons. So this is the process of fine tuning. Okay. So once we do this fine tuning, we get we restrain our system and get the results. Okay. Now comes like this concept of multiple kernel learning. Since already stated, I wanted to this is my curiosity to see what the system is learning using CNN and how much is it different from my handcrafted entropy based features which I have used in the previous contribution so um kernel is a very uh, i will say a very simple yet advanced function basically it is computing a similarity between two instances but in a higher dimensional space uh, and it is not explicitly mapping it into the higher dimensional space but the kernel function which is it, it itself gives you an intuition that it is mapping into a higher dimension space so for example in rbf kernel the formula is like e raised to the power uh, x minus y so x minus y is basically taking the similarity okay x and y how much similar or dissimilar they are and e raised to the power of that similarity or dissimilarity is basically mapping that similarity to that thing to a, some different space in an exponential space i'm not watching the similarity in the linear domain i'm watching the similarity in exponential domain how is it so this is like the concept of kernel so when we don't want explicitly or manually to map the data to higher dimensional space we use kernels to do it sorry now what is multiple kernel learning the main reason actually behind going through a kernel based approach was that uh, since I used SVM in my machine learning based approaches, I would like to reflect something on it later. So I went for the kernel. So what happens is if I think each and everyone, if they are anyone who is who has used the machine learning will surely have used the SVM. 
So in SVM, we use these kernels for classification. So usually we don't, for example, we have two features. If we have heard about the iris data set, we have sepal length and petal width, for example. And we are just using all these features and using one single kernel. So it might be that the value range of petal width are different from the, uh, the length wise sepal length features. So what is this? We should use individual kernel for each different types of features so that you can see the similarity properly, like how much similarity is there between the instances using the sepal length compared to petal width. So we, it is like um, map watching the similarity in more in a homogeneous data rather than in a heterogeneous data. So in this context, multiple kernel learning is, is a good thing because it makes a single kernel using linear combination of other basis kernels. So what is it like? You make kernel for petal length explicitly. You make the kernel of petal width explicitly, sepal length explicitly, sepal width explicitly. You have all these four uh, features, types of features. You make one kernel for each and you just uh, add those kernels with some linear combination of weight to make one final single kernel on the condition that the weights of these kernels will sum up to one and all the weights should be more than or equal to zero. So this is the idea of multiple kernel learning. Then this is a prerequisite. So gram matrix or we can say a kernel matrix is basically a matrix which contains the similarity of all the pairwise uh, similarity for the data. So since uh, if we are using some kernel function, so it becomes a kernel matrix and it is like a positive symmetric positive semi-definite matrix. Now the comes the uh, question like what kernel similarity measures we need. So the idea of kernel similarity measures basically is like I want to compute similarity between two kernel matrices now. I have one kernel matrix suppose like this and another kernel matrix also. Now I want to see the similarity between these two kernel matrices. So uh, till now we were dealing with instances. For instances, we have the kernel, but for matrix, we have the kernel similarity measures explicitly. So these are some uh, three kernel similarity measures. If you just, uh, it might appear very uh, complex, but it is very simple and it is analogous to correlation coefficient. So you are just performing correlation between two matrices. So when we deal with matrices, we use Frobenius norm. For example, for a vector, we use L2 norm or the Euclidean norm for getting its absolute value. For matrices, we use Frobenius norm. Next is uh, normalized kernel difference. It is just like taking the difference of the matrices and uh, using the Frobenius norm. And next is like Hilbert Schmidt independence criteria. So this is like computing the cross covariance of the two matrices. So, so I will not say that these are the only ones, but these are the ones which I have undertaken for computing the similarity. Now it's like, uh, what is the idea of uh, how am I going to use this kernel similarity measure or this multiple kernel learning? So uh, consider you have listed your, you have made an output ideal kernel matrix, which have CAD instance, first of all, lined up in this quadrant. And next quadrant, you have the normal instances. Similarly, here also in the row wise, you have uh, the column wise, you have uh, listed all the CAD instances and then again the normal instances. So, ideally, what should happen when you compute the similarity of CAD instances with CAD instances, they should appear as like high. The similarity of uh, instances from same class level should be high compared to similarity of instances from different class levels. So in this way, an ideal kernel matrix, this kernel matrix is simply composed using, currently I'm using just the output levels. So for example, you have used ones for CAD and zeros for normal or minus one for normal and one for CAD. So uh, first and this quadrant and this quadrant should be one 
and the di diagonally opposite should be zeros. So this is an ideal kernel matrix. Now, what I am doing is, so for example, I use uh, how the main basically the task here is to estimate these weights for using the multiple kernel learning. I want to know what should be the weight. I have the information that what should be the kernel matrix. So in my case, I will be using the kernel matrix of Shannon, of the entropies. Shannon entropy, one kernel matrix would be for the Rennie entropy and another kernel matrix would be for the embedding which I have learned from the CNNs. So I have three types of features and I have computed three kernel matrices for them. But now I want to uh, find out what should be the suitable weights. So for finding these weights, I'm using these similarity measures, kernel assignment, alignment and denormalized kernel difference. So, the, so my basic approach is that the each and every kernel which I'm using should maximize the similarity with the ideal target kernel, but it should minimize the redundancy with other basis kernels. So the feature which is more contributive towards classifying should get higher weightage, but it should also accompany the fact that if it is redundant with the existing features, it should accommodate that factor too. So in any sort of machine learning based approach, wherein you are trying to find some features or any sort of other, um, I will say like method, redundancy and the relevance are like two terms which go hand in hand. Everyone wants to be relevant with respect to the target problem, but redundancy is also one of the criteria so that you don't put irrelevant content in the information. For example, if you can say that height is able to classify a person, then weight would be extremely redundant. But if you say that no, weight also contributes in re removing some errors, then okay, assign more weight to height, but lesser weight to uh, lesser weightage to the weight feature in order to identify a person. Similarly, in our problems also, I'm trying to since I don't know whether embeddings are more in discriminative or my handcrafted features are more discriminative. So I'm trying to estimate the weights automatically. Okay, the system should learn and identify which should be weighted more. Should they be weighted equally or uh, with different weight metrics? So this is like main idea to maximize the similarity with ideal target kernel. So the feature or the, uh, the kernel matrix form with any feature should resemble more like this, but if it is redundant with other matrices, it should accom accommodate that fact. So how to compute the weight? For example, I'm using kernel alignment uh, for estimating the weights. So what I do is I compute the similarity of that kernel with an ideal kernel and divide the denominator with rest of the kernel. So I want more, inf so numerator is accommodating for relevance and denominators accommodating the redundancy. Similarly, with normalized kernel difference also, numerator is accommodating the relevance, but I have put inverse here. So if x and y are similar, so x minus y is zero, but uh, zero means more similarity. So I'm taking like the inverse of it to accommodate for the higher weightage in the numerator and lesser weightage at the denominator. Similarly, HSIC. So in this way, I'm computing the weight for each of the kernels or the features which I'm using for the fusion. So uh, that sums up the MKL approach, not just a, there are like some prerequisites of using the uh, time frequency matrix as an input in your CNN. Since you had a two dimensional matrix and these pre-trained CNNs basically this, uh, they were they are using a three dimensional input. So in such cases, you can simply map the values of the time frequency representation to some RGB image using any color map of your choice. So I preferred a jet color map and then I resize it into a proper size, which the 
CNN accept or the network accepts using a bilinear transformation. And now, since this is like a training a neural network, so we needed some training data, testing data, and relation data. And these are the parameters of that population. Okay, so this is just a, uh, a visual illustration of the of the kernel matrices. So concatenation is for four different cases and showing the relevance of MKL. So concat first case is concatenate. That is adjust concatenate all the features, Shannon entropy, Rainy entropy, as well as the embedding, and just use one single kernel to uh, uh, or kernel matrix to perform the classification. Next is simple multiple kernel learning. That is, I'm using unit weight or the same weight for all the three matrix. Uh, next is OWMKL. So this is like uh, an approach where only relevance was accommodated in the weights that is they were only focusing on the uh, similarity with the ideal kernel and this is the pwmkl which is the proposed one where i am also using similarity as well as redundancy so what we see is like if we see the first and fourth quadrant so they are like going towards more prominent like the uh, they are getting more uh, maximized getting maximized more compared to simple concatenation case. So this is like the intuition behind, okay, why you should go for, uh, uh, why a MKL approach is better than simple concatenating the data and using a single kernel for classification. Uh, this figure is basically just the weight assignment, which uh, shows that, okay, how the weights were assigned using each similarity measure. So SE is Shannon entropy, RE is Renyi entropy, and DF is the embeddings which are learned from the CNN. So we see all the three similarity measures assign higher weight to the embeddings. That is, they are more relevant for the classification. Okay, that is pretty much good that CNNs have learned much more than the embeddings. Then we see how is the weight distribution for Shannon entropy and Renyi entropy explicitly. So what we see is that, see, uh, as I discussed before that these entropies are also redundant among themselves, but they are also complementary. So the weight assignment shows that, okay, more weightage was assigned to Reni and less weightage compared to Shannon entropy. So this shows, okay, they, uh, the method which I have used is accommodating these facts also, which I have learned before. Now come see, um, so this was like summing up all the signal processing or the aspect and the feature extraction process, either handcrafted or representation. For, for framing the machine learning model, basically uh, we are left only with few main building blocks. If you are going with obviously a handcrafted approach, you might need feature selection, may or may not. But if you go, it is better. So in the case, uh, basically, so there are multiple feature extraction methods and I would not like to focus more on them. Uh, so we have used like filter-based feature selection method. Filter-based feature selection method is like, you just filter whatever is good for you and then just train your model. So that feature selection is not a part during the classification stages. Like you already filter your good features using your training data and just use those good features in the classification. There are other methods also like uh, the wrapper method and the embedded methods wherein you during the course of classification identify which features are good or bad for your uh, performance. So here I have like used uh, minimum redundancy and maximum relevance as a uh, feature and these are like some prerequisites for using it. So whenever you are dealing with mutual information or these types of terms you should, your data should be like more of a, of a discrete form. Discrete form is like levels. For example, if you are dealing with 0 0.1 to 0 0.2, so these values would not be like good to be used in a entropy based or mutual information based metrics. So it is better that you discretize your data, data like divide it into some forms of levels. Okay, the values in the range of 0 to 5 will be label, labeled as 1 and so on. So the feature discretization needs to be done. And then you get the rank. 
Next is training and testing. So this is very essential if you are dealing with small data set. In case of large data set, one randomly takes up a subset of data as training and then testing and validation, etc. But we don't have this luxury. Given with 960 instances, there is no luxury that I will use 800 for training and rest 200. Moreover, this would be like a more of a biased approach. Like how can you use just those fixed 800 sets? It might happen that different combinations of subjects might change your result since a low amount of data comes with its own biases. So you need to be uh, like very impartial towards the training subsets you are forming as well as the testing subsets you are using. Okay, so what we what a good approach is to use a cross validation approach and even like iterate it for different iterations. So for example, I have divided my data into five folds but I have done it like 20 times and in each iteration, I'm taking different divisions of the fivefold. So this is like, uh, I'm expanding the number of iterations of my test training and testing. So it is like I'm testing 100 times with different combinations of subjects or epochs so that I don't get any sort of bias results. But however, one should with in medical uh, domain processing, which should be kept in mind is that if you are using epochs from a, from a subject, they should be either present in the training or they should be present in the testing. You should not mix and match that the epochs from a single subject or patient is present in training also and it is in testing also. Because in real life, you will not experience that. You might have a cat image in your database, which is also at the testing stage, but obviously you will never go into, you're never going to test a subject whose data you already have in your training data. So here comes like the difference between normal machine learning task and a medical based task. And last but not least is classifier. So this is like we have used SVM classifier. The reason behind using the SVM classifier is like, it is good for dealing with low instance databases. So you don't, it is like very unprone, it is not very prone to un overfitting. So this is like the main advantage. Next, it uses a kernel based approach for expanding your data to high dimensional. And third is like last but not the least, you can make your own kernel matrices and give them as an input directly through the classifier. So you can make your own kernels and use it in to give uh, for the classification. So these are like three important advantages of using SVM. So whenever you choose a classifier, don't just use it like vaguely. Have some clear criteria why you will be using it, what advantages are you going, and can you contribute in some fashion or another to the machine learning model itself. So for example, in my first two contribution, I didn't contribute to the machine learning model much, but in the third contribution i tried to contribute in the machine learning model by making my own kernel matrices so it is not i will say like even though you are if you are not working on the deep learning problems then to also being on the simple machine learning sides the handcrafted features you can use such approaches to contribute more towards the conventional form of machine learning so, next is the performance metrics this is last but not the least a performance pro, selection of proper performance metrics is very crucial in order to portray your results or pu commerce public to make a good publicity of your results or your research paper you should use proper mat matrices there are multitude of matrices starting from precision recall false error rate and so on so it is like totally on your problem definition what you choose it might be that for some people sensitivity is only important but for other people overall accuracy is important so for me i have chosen like all these four matrices sensitivity specificity accuracy and kappa so sensitivity i request uh, prabhu to kindly uh, mute your mic it's causing some noise yeah, ma'am, you could continue. 
I'll this is the last slide. So sensitivity is basically identifying the percentage of correctly classified CAT subjects and specificity is uh, correctly classifying the normal subject. So you could choose your sensitivity. For me, the sensitivity is emphasizing more on disease cases. But if you are if you want to identify more of normal subjects, so it is like up to your definition which you are illustrating. And next is like accuracy overall. And this is kappa. So kappa is basically like in normal terminology, you can say how much two physicians are agreeing on the diagnosis result of a subject. If they are saying uh, same things, okay, yeah, it means the diagnosis is good uh, and it is like more obvious that it is disease or normal. But if they are not agreeing well, then obviously there is some confusion. So kappa is analogous to this physicians, uh, two physicians holding same decisions. So it also ranges like between zero to one, the higher it is, the better it is. So here we are computing kappa between the ground truth and the one which is predicted by us. So yeah, so that sums it all. Any questions? Thank you, ma'am, for that fantastic presentation. So we can open up the floor for questions. So if anybody has any questions, you can unmute yourself and ask at this point. Uh, hello there. I have one uh, small doubt. Yeah. Uh, you use the jet color mapping, right? Is there any particular significance for using that jet color mapping? Uh, there's not some particular reference, but yeah, obviously when we go through different color maps, we find that what I found personally was that uh, jet color map gives you give, uh, like a wide range of colors, which helps the obviously the network to extract features more if it is focusing more on the big it's just like color gradient then it will have better capability to identify different textures compared to other color maps if they are using less sort of color range so this is like my intuition that you should go for a color map which has more color gradients so it helps the extractor or the a general know-how is also based on the same you will look more for color gradients if you are working on such problems. So better to have more ranges. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, any more questions from anyone else? Please go ahead. Okay, seeing that there are no more questions, I would like to provide the concluding note. So firstly, I would like to extend my uh, heartfelt thanks to Akanksha ma'am for taking out time from her busy schedule and preparing this uh, fantastic presentation for us. It was uh, very detailed and not only did we come to know about her research expertise, but we also came to know about the workflow that uh, needs, needs to be carried on in order to make a very established research. So thank you ma'am for that and also for delivering your speech uh, at a time which is very early in the morning at your place. It's okay. Thank you for inviting me and having me here. It was a good uh, experience. Like, um, though we have given presentations before, but giving the same topic presentation to a crowd which who is not that much expertise or does not have same uh, research problems at similar to yours is a completely a different task. So I would, I would also like uh, like to convey that other people should also, irrespective whether they have completed the research or not, they should try to give such talks because it not only helps you, it helps you to portray your presentation into a different format. That like how a some someone who has not yet heard about your problem or who doesn't listens to your aware about your research goals or methods, how are you able to tell him? or convey more information to him or her. So this is like a good practice, which everyone should go through. I regret that why am I taking it so late? I should have gone through it like before also. So yeah, thank you. That's absolutely agreed. So thank you, ma'am. And thank you to all the audience who have stayed with us and have participated in this talk. So hope to have all of you 
again in the next talk and a very good evening to everyone we will conclude the session good evening